Ger bir kere. Mission Impossible 2. Wrapping up this week's What I've Watched live stream. I appreciate you all for sticking around this long as we're currently an hour and 43 minutes into this live stream. And this is the last film I'll be talking about. Uh, this is the second film in the Mission Impossible film series starring Tom Cruise. And this one was actually directed by John Woo, who's known for directing a lot of uh, very over-the-top stylistic action films. Uh, his other well-known film is Face Off, starring Nicolas Cage and Andre Volta. This and Face Off are the only John Woo films I've actually seen, but he's directed other films that a lot of people like, like Hard Boiled, uh, Hard Target, Broken Arrow. I know he also directed a war movie with Nicolas Cage called Wind Talkers. Uh, if there's any John Woo movies that you like that I haven't seen, let me know in the comments below i might do a john woo director project one of these days who knows because john woo just from the two movies i've seen his style of action is really really cool but diving into the plot synopsis of mission impossible 2 agent ethan hunt races across australia and spain to stop a former imf agent from unleashing a genetically engineered biological weapon called chimera this misstep uh, should hunt not this misstep, this mission, should even uh, choose to accept it, plunges him into the center of an international crisis of terrifying magnitude. So like I said at the beginning of the stream, uh, I do have a guest joining me on this, uh, on this review. Uh, he sent me his video link earlier this week. Uh, we got G.R. Garrett from his channel Cinematic Tendency, who I've had on the channel a time or two. He is... Uh, I, I definitely thank him for accepting the invitation to join me in this collab for Mission Impossible 2, which is often seen as the worst film in the franchise. But do I agree with that sentiment? Does GR agree with that sentiment? Well, let's hear what he has to say on Mission Impossible 2. <laughs> So uh, today uh, we are talking about Mission Impossible 2 and um, I am happy that uh, Jacob invited me to be part of, uh, of this video and also uh, to be part of this uh, uh, video uh, series of Mission Impossible like I said because this is one of the franchises that I, that, that I love and also I have seen all of these movies in theaters except for the first one. As a fan of the franchise, um, I do believe that Mission Impossible 2 is the movie that most of the fandom uh, appreciates uh, the least. Uh, maybe, maybe they hate it or maybe they don't hate it, but uh, what I believe is like this is the movie in the entire franchise that gets less love for whatever reason. What about me? Uh, well, uh, I don't think that this is the best movie of the franchise, but actually I haven't, myself, I haven't uh, ranked all of the movies. Uh, maybe I will one day, but I do know that Mission Impossible 2, I would put it somewhere, somewhere high up. So having said that, in this video, I am gonna give you my personal reasons why I appreciate this movie, my personal reasons why I enjoy the movie and why I will put it somewhere high up. And before I give you my reasons of the actual uh, movie, uh, I am gonna say some other reasons or personal reasons that are closely related to the movie. Uh, as you may know, uh, Mission Impossible 2 came out in the year 2000. So, if you are my age, man, in 2000, we had just survived the Y2K. In the year 2000, MTV was still pretty cool, man. I remember those years. I remember those times. I don't watch MTV anymore. And the reason why 
I'm telling you about MTV is because Limbiscuit and Metallica they did two songs, uh, one song each for this movie. And as a matter of fact, Metallica uh, wrote a song, uh, I Disappear, okay, that's the name of the song, exclusively for uh, MI2, so it's in the soundtrack. And that it also started that uh, you may, may, may know or maybe not about that Napster back, back in the day, so that Metallica versus Napster. So yeah, it had to do with the song, I Disappear. So like I said, a song exclusively written for MI2. Now, how cool is that? And also, if you're a fan of uh, Limp Bizkit, yeah, you know that Fred Durst, they did, he and his band, they did a pretty cool uh, video uh, for this movie MI2 and it has a sick version of the Mission Impossible theme. So now with those two reasons out of the way, now let's just talk about the actual uh, movie and I think that uh, when people love a movie or hate a movie for the most part it always gonna come down to the director so I believe that people who may not uh, uh, like or may not truly uh, enjoy uh, the Hong Kong uh, style of shooting action films then most likely are not gonna really click with MI2 so as you may or may not know uh, John Woo that director of MI2 was the one who was chosen by Tom Cruise himself to be the director of MI2 at that point in time uh, John Woo was still kind of new here uh, in the United States uh, his very first uh, movie here in the USA was uh, Hard Target and I told you earlier that I am biased towards uh, John Woo because uh, Hard Target is like one, if not, uh, one of my most favorite movies of uh, the one and the only Jean-Claude Van Damme. So, in MI2, you're going to see uh, John Woo all over. His DNA, his fingerprints are all over, all over MI2. Uh, so he did a hard target uh, first here in the States. And then I don't know if the, if the second one was uh, Face Off. If it wasn't the second one, perhaps was the third one. But MI2 was either maybe the fourth or the fifth. Uh, of his movies made here in the USA so yeah so if you like face off and if you like hard target maybe you're gonna like uh, MI2 because like I said you're gonna see a lot of similarities in MI2 that you already saw in the previous movies for instance the way that Ethan Hunt shoots his guns in MI2 is the same way that Chance Woodrow does in Hard Target and also the same way that Castor Troy does in Face Off. Yeah, I'm talking about shooting uh, the guns with both hands. Uh, you're gonna see that similarity throughout all of those three movies. Again, that's uh, like a trademark of uh, John Woo. If you are a lot into watching uh, movies, then you already know that some directors uh, they have this kind of style or, or trademark. For uh, instance, uh, you know that Quentin Tarantino he has his thing with uh, women's feet, right? I mean, <laughs> we all know that. Uh, you, we also know that uh, director Michael Bay, he loves his explosions, okay? 
explosions here, explosions there, explosions everywhere. <clears throat> That's his style. Now, John Woo is also one of these directors. And I don't mean um, all of this shooting uh, with both hands and stuff, although that is part of it, but his main trademark is the use of doves or pigeons in his movies. He likes to put a pigeon or a dove either in, a, in one scene or, or next to the hero of the movie as he did in Hard Target and also Face Off and of course with Ethan Hunt in MI2. Now, we're talking about action, how this uh, movie has a lot of action, uh, Hong Kong style. And um, this is not a fact because I haven't double checked, but uh, I suspect and I almost, I think that I'm right. And if I'm not, let me know down in the comments. I think that in MI2 or Mission Impossible 2, this is the only movie in the entire franchise that we see Ethan Hunt shoot as many bullets, all right? Like, you're, he's not gonna shoot that many bullets in the entire franchise. Uh, like I said, I don't know if I'm right, but I think that I am. So again, if you wanna, you know, get into that uh, rabbit hole, hey, let me know down in the comments. So yeah, I believe, like I said, in Mission Impossible 2, this is the only movie where Ethan Hunt shoots way more bullets, way more guns than any other Mission Impossible movie. Now, there is something interesting in MI, MI2 uh, when it comes to uh, Ethan, Ethan Hunt, uh, that I haven't seen in the other movies. I don't remember about uh, the first movie, Mission Impossible, but I do remember about uh, Mission Impossible uh, 3, uh, Ghost Protocol, Rogue Nation, and Fallout. You know, like in all those movies, uh, except for two, in all those movies, Ethan Hunt, he seems to be a little, a little afraid uh, or a little nervous when in the movie they are discussing that okay Ethan you're gonna have to you know you're gonna have to go underwater and you're gonna have to hold your your breath for three minutes right or you're gonna have to climb this glass building um, you know like in, in the conversation in the movie he seems a little like oh man I'm a little scared what if I what if I die you know but interesting interestingly enough in MI2 during the opening, right? It's, it's interesting that he's just climbing, he's going solo, right? Like no cables, just climbing this high, uh, high, high uh, mountain. I think it was shot uh, somewhere in Utah, uh, like in, in a real movie. And he's just like climbing and, and from cliff to cliff, jumping without any, any harness, any wires. Obviously, I'm talking as Ethan Hunt, right? Not as Tom Cruise. So as Ethan, he's like climbing, just like, hey, it's another day at the office. So I don't know. I just find it interesting that in MI2, Ethan Hunt, he's a daredevil. He's, he's like climbing uh, solo, no wires. He's, he's having a, a standoff in the motorcycle with the, with the, with the main villain. And like I said, he's this uh, daredevil of a character that we don't, I don't think uh, he's not the same in the upcoming uh, sequels. Uh, am I right or is it just me? Also, when it comes to his uh, love life, uh, seems like in this movie, you know, I, I like that, uh, that chemistry that he has with, uh, I think her name is Nia, Nia Ho. I forgot her name in, in, in the movie, the name of her character. But one of the memorable uh, scenes um, uh, for me, since I watched this movie in the theater, I just, I don't know. I always remember that uh, when they're like flirting, you know, I like, you know, like Ethan and, and, and this, um, uh, she's, she's, she's a professional thief, right, in the movie. Uh, I like that uh, flirting chemistry that they have, and for some reason, in my mind, that scene in the in the top when uh, you know during the first act, 
that she gets on top of him and then they flip or whatever. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, since the first time I saw that scene in the movie theater, I remember sitting, oh man, that's cool, I don't know. <laughs> it's always been in my mind, for whatever reason, so take it as you may. Personally, as a movie watcher, as a movie fan myself, I, I usually uh, or always appreciate when a movie, when they have a, uh, a plot twist, you know, and uh, Obviously, Mission Impossible is one of those franchises because they use a lot of like, like th those masks, kind of like, ah, gotcha, it was me, you know. And I like how they did that from the very beginning, from the opening credits, all right? Uh, when he's like, what do you keep calling me, Dimitri, right? Uh, 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 at the opening. And then how uh, uh, the villain, he tricked the scientists, and then towards the end, he gets tricked by Ethan, so the villain kills his main guy, right? His 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 right hand. So I like this. Uh, this is, you know, like when I watched it for the first time, I was like, "Oh, that's pretty cool, man!" And uh, I don't know. I mean, like I said, I like plot twists, and I think that plot twist in that movie was was well executed. That's the way I see it. If you disagree, also. Let me know down in the comments below. One more thing that I like about John Woo's uh, style is how he gives me uh, anxiety with little or with normal, uh, uh, I don't, don't want to say normal situation, but with, with little objects or with objects that, uh, that we have, you know, here at the house, you know. Uh, he did it. He did it with uh, in the movie Hard Target, all right? And also he did it again in this movie, in Mission Impossible 2, with that um, cigar uh, cutter. And I don't know, I just, find it, I just find it interesting how he gives me that much uh, anxiety and, and tension uh, in the movie no matter how many times I have seen that scene before, I always get this anxiety. I, I don't know, it makes me, like, you know, it makes me nervous. It makes me like, oh man, I don't want to watch. Even though, like I said, I've seen that, that scene many times, he still gets me. Now, by, by no means, uh, uh, MI2 is a perfect movie. Uh, there's no such thing. So I think one of my main complaints would be uh, the villain. Um, I wanted to see a little bit more of him. Uh, on the other hand, I think that's the only villain other than, than Walker in, uh, in uh, Mission Impossible Fallout. Uh, other than Walker, uh, this one in, uh, uh, in Mission Impossible 2, this villain is the only one that is uh, he can give uh, uh, a challenge to Ethan Hunt on a hand-to-hand -hand, uh, fight, right? Um, you know, they fight each other at the end, they use a lot of kicks, a lot of slow-mos, a lot of, like I said, uh, Hong Kong style uh, of, uh, of fighting. And uh, yeah, so I like this villain because like, he, he's physically, uh, challenging to Ethan other than the rest of the upcoming uh, villains they're not very much uh, other than, like I said other than Superman himself the Walker Henry Cavill overall guys like I said um, I am one of the guys who finds uh, MI2 uh, enjoyable who finds this movie to be not only entertaining but who gives enough or more love to Mission Impossible 2 than the majority of people. Yeah, so yeah, that's me. Hey, maybe you are like me or maybe you are part of the majority. Hey, I would like to know your thoughts, so let us know down in the comments below. And uh, Jacob, thank you for having me. Uh, I, I had a great time. Um, Rewatching MI2, so I started uh, uh, a few days ago uh, rewatching rewatching this movie, and then I just kept 
I just kept going. Um, I, I didn't I, I didn't rewatch the original, the first one from 90, 96. But uh, now, the, last night, I finished uh, Fallout again. Uh, so now I think maybe in the next few days I'm gonna I'm gonna go back and start with the first one because I skipped it. But uh, but I did watch your review with uh, with Dave of uh, interpreting the stars about the original MI MI movie. And yeah, and like I told you in the comments, I agree with a lot of his a lot of his points. All right, guys. So thank you guys for watching and please subscribe to uh, Jacob's uh, channel. Check out, check out his content. And if you want to subscribe uh, to mine, I'm pretty sure Jacob will include a link somewhere down below. All right, guys. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you soon. And until then, chocalaman. All right. Thank you. GR for sharing your thoughts on Mission Impossible 2. I highly enjoyed hearing your thoughts on this movie, and I'm glad you got some enjoyment out of this movie. That's, I think, what we want in a lot of movies is to get some enjoyment out of something, even if you're in uh, the minority. I'm glad you're a fan of Mission Impossible 2. Like he said, I'll leave a link in the description down below, not just in this live stream, but also when I re-upload this as a standalone review, you can check out his channel, Cinematic Tendency. He does a lot of reviews. He does unboxings. He does uh, theater trips. He always catches up on the newest movies, and he has some good stuff over on his channel. Go check out G.R. Garrett's channel, Cinematic Tendency. And again, thank you for sharing your thoughts on Mission Impossible 2. And now here's my thoughts on Mission Impossible 2. Um. This one has always been my least favorite in the Mission Impossible franchise. Uh, even when I first watched all the Mission Impossible movies, this one always felt off to me compared to the other Mission Impossible films. I found like an interesting relationship with this movie because there's been some times where I enjoy some aspects of the movie and then there's other parts where I've downright hated the movie. But now I'm at a point where I don't think it's a terrible movie, but I don't think it's a good movie. Uh, the best thing about Mission Impossible 2, uh, like GR was talking about, John Woo's fingerprints in this entire movie is the best thing about Mission Impossible 2. And I wish I would put this in the positive range as far as rating movies go because John Woo is an awesome action director. Between I've only seen this in Face Off, but he does some really awesome stuff with action, like the practical stunt work the over-the-top stylized action, the slow-mo, the stunt work they does, and then what Jar was talking about with all the guns going off and the way it's done in over-the-top fashion. He excels in that. Face-Off is like a John Woo movie done right. Uh, I love how he makes the action and the storytelling. Whereas I feel like Mission Impossible 2 didn't have that good balance. At least with this movie, the action in Mission Impossible 2 is absolutely awesome. There's a uh, really great opening sequence where it's not really action per se. It's just Tom Cruise on vacation, Ethan Hunt going rock climbing with no wires. And that was awesome. I love seeing what he does on his day off. And as GR said, he's kind of a daredevil in this, but I feel like there's, uh, I guess I'll dive into more of that in my negatives. I feel like it kind of takes away the human aspect, which I love about Ethan Hunt's character, which we see more so in the later films. But the sequence is still pretty awesome nonetheless. And it kind of blows me away that the studio is willing to allow Tom Cruise to climb, to go rock climbing like that, jump from cliff to cliff with no wires or anything. I bet that was the stress of the studio had going Ooh, oh, is he going to do this? Is he going to do this? Is he going to make it? But he made it, and it's an awesome scene. Uh, there's a motorcycle chase in the third act, which is awesome. Uh, some good some good fight choreography in the film. Uh, he executes slow-mo well in a lot of these action scenes. And some of them get real ridiculous, like Tom Cruise and the villain get into this chicken match on their motorcycles. Everybody jump off, run into each other, they fall off. Uh, 
a good number of feet onto a beach, no broken bones whatsoever. At times, I felt like I was watching a Fast and Furious movie, but directed by John Woo with a lot more style. But, hey, he does some awesome stuff with the action in this movie. I want to love this movie because I do like how John Woo handles action. However, I'm not too big on the story in this movie, and that's the biggest thing that turns me off from this movie every time because a lot of the action in Mission Impossible 2 is only in the second half of the film. It's a two-hour movie. The first half of this movie is a chore to get through. You got Ethan Hunt. He's going on this mission. He's got to recruit this uh, female thief played by Fanny Newton. And she's an interesting character, don't get me wrong. Very attractive. I like the chemistry that the two actors have on screen. But this story is still not that interesting. Like a film's really trying to sell that these characters in the span of one night are madly in love with each other. Yet the emotional crux of the story is just not there because I don't think the love story is that interesting. Wow. The flirtatious chemistry is fun to watch, but the emotional side of the story does not work because they just fell in, they just spent like one night together and they're supposed to be like madly in love with each other and then like the storyline uh, she gets recruited to seduce the villain of the film which was her ex-boyfriend or whatever to try to get the information that the IMF team needs to take the guy out and it's played out like a love triangle almost and uh Unlike what I talked about earlier in the stream with the She's Funny That Way, where I feel like that the love triangle worked in that film because it was played for laughs. It does not work in this movie because it's played straight. I'm not a fan of the trope, and I I was just like rolling my eyes with how cringy a lot of the, the setup with that was. And they, they do like... As much as the John Woo's use of slow-mo works in the action scenes, when it's used when characters are romantically staring at each other, it is very cringe. Almost to the point where it's unintentionally hilarious. Like, there's a part where uh, Fanny Newton and the villainous character, they are staring at each other, and then the wind's blowing, and then there's a slow-mo shot of the guy reaching out to grab the scarf that's being blown away in slow-mo. And it is so unintentionally hilarious. I couldn't stop laughing at all the wrong ways uh, when watching that scene. So that aspect doesn't work. I'm not a big fan of the plot. It's very ridiculously convoluted with this device called the Camara. Uh, which is created by this mad scientist that the villain ends up stealing. And the reason why it was created was to counteract with like this other weapon that's being used for good. And so he's like, oh, if for every hero, there's a villain. So the reasoning why it's made is absolute nonsense. It makes no sense. And then the villain wants it for its own gain. And then there's like this shady guy at the corporation. We don't know what he's up against. And, uh, there's, there's just some weird double crosses, and it's unlike in the first film where the story being convoluted actually works for the benefit of being an espionage film. This being a straight-up action film and it being that convoluted doesn't really work for me in the slightest. And again, it makes the first half of the movie so slow to watch. The movie picks up once uh, Ethan Hunt breaks into the company to try to get the weapon for himself. And that's when we get the cool John Woo shootouts and we get Tom Cruise parachuting out of the building. And then there's a race against the clock as the uh, uh, the woman, uh, Fanny Newton, injects herself with the virus to uh, keep it from getting out of the wrong hands. So there's a rush to find the antidote to cure her of the virus before she dies. Uh, and then you get the cool shootouts and motorcycle chase at the end. There's a cool brawl on the beat. There's this really crazy stunt where the villain points a knife and Tom Cruise stops it from cutting its eye. And you see the shot of the knife coming so close to his eye. And it's like, it's like an adrenaline rush. Cause like, Oh, if that stunt went wrong, Tom Cruise would have lost his eye. That would have been crazy. The John Woo elements of this movie are really awesome. He does a lot of his trademark stuff. 
the double guns, jumping out and pointing his guns and shooting sideways, his obsession with birds, which it's used to the birds in this movie, especially when the white pigeon shows up, when Tom Cruise uh, shoots the door down and it explodes. And then the white dove is flying out, almost hailing like Tom Cruise is like the Messiah or something. It was it was so hilarious seeing how they did that. It was so it was like all, it was almost like camp levels of hilarious almost. But yeah, this is still my least favorite film in the franchise. Some elements of this movie to me almost feel like a parody of Mission Impossible film, whereas the later films kind of dive more into the human element of Ethan Hunt, where you know you see him do these awesome stunts, but he's also human at the front and center of it with emotions, whereas this Ethan Hunt in Mission Impossible 2 is like a daredevil that's almost like a caricature at times. He's way more smug in this movie than he is in the other films. And I'd say of all the films, this is probably my least favorite performance from Tom Cruise in the Mission Impossible movies. Not that he's horrible. I mean, he still commits to the role, but I prefer the more vulnerable side of Ethan Hunt, which we see in the later movies, which mix his character with the amazing action and the uh, later Mission Impossible films have more investing stories at the same time. This is a frustrating watch because I want to enjoy this film much like GR and being the John Woo fan. I love the John Woo action. And that's what makes this movie watchable in chunks, especially in the second half of the movie. But the first half of the movie mixed with the story uh, the romance elements would fall flat for me. And uh, just the story in general and how convoluted it is with the virus and all that does not work for me in the slightest. And this is the only Mission Impossible film that does not have a fresh rating for me. It's my least favorite in the franchise and is the only real misfire in the Mission Impossible films for me. But if you're like uh, GR and you enjoy this movie for what it is, then more power to you for doing that. I'm glad you can, excuse me, I'm glad you can get something out of the film. But for me, aside from the action, this film is another snooze. So I ended up giving Mission Impossible 2 a uh, two and a half out of five stars on Letterboxd. And I gave the film a 46 out of 100 on my 100 point scale. Got a few comments in there. Jason says, this was the weakest of the Mission Impossible movies. Some good motorcycle action, but boring story. I do agree with you on that completely. Um, and Jason says, John Woo is a lot like Zack Snyder to me. The action is too stylized and take me out of the movie. I actually enjoy when directors do stylized action where they do their own stamp on how to do action. Like it makes their movies stand out. Like when John Woo does his action well, they're great movies like face off. And I feel the same thing with Zack Snyder. When he over stylizes his movies, they stand out and they make me appreciate the movies as a whole. Like especially his DCU output. Uh, Zack Snyder does some really cool stuff with the action, but I, I guess it all depends on how I know. I think John Woo and Zack Snyder are divisive directors. I think Zack is more divisive than John Woo, but I guess it all depends on how you enjoy your, action movies and like i said with mission impossible 2 if the story is on par with the action then i would have enjoyed mission impossible 2 a lot more 